From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. Here is your host, Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that explores the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. In this episode, we're going to continue our conversation about the year ahead with part two of our special series on key technology trends in 2021. This time, we're going to take a look at the push to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve fuel efficiency in the trucking industry. In recent years, many large shippers have announced aggressive goals for environmental sustainability. At the same time, federal and state clean air regulations will continue to drive further reductions in carbon emissions and improvements in truck fuel economy. Manufacturers are doing their part by developing cleaner diesel models and introducing their first electric powered trucks. But the vehicles are only one part of the equation. Fleet management, route optimization, and driver performance are also major elements of a fleet's overall fuel economy. So how can technology address those factors and help transportation companies operate more efficiently? We'll set out to answer that question in this episode. To do just that, we're going to bring in the CEOs of two transportation technology companies who are right in the middle of this trend. Later in the program, you'll hear from Jeff Baer, founder and CEO of LinkDrive. But first, we're excited to welcome Chris Wolf back to the podcast. Chris is the CEO of PowerFleet, a provider of telematics and asset tracking technology for the trucking industry. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Hey, Seth. Thanks for having me back on. So I'd like to speak with you about one of the trends that I think is going to drive technology adoption in the trucking industry in the year ahead, and that's the ongoing push by shippers, motor carriers, 3PLs, and of course, regulatory agencies to reduce carbon emissions in the supply chain. So recently, there's been a lot of focus on the vehicles themselves. You know, the truck manufacturers are all beginning to introduce their first electric powered models and uh, diesel trucks, of course, are also becoming more efficient in line with the phase two greenhouse gas emission standards. But the vehicle is only one part of uh, sustainability. It's only one element of the overall picture. Operational efficiency and equipment utilization also play a huge part in this. So in your view, Chris, just how much opportunity remains to reduce fuel consumption and emissions through more efficient fleet management and better tracking and freight visibility technology. Seth, our best estimate is about five to 8%. And that's primarily through what we call driver behavior management. So if you think about speeding, uh, you know, rapid acceleration, uh, too much idling, elimination of wasted time. I mean, that's a a big issue in the industry right now, specifically shippers, constant ease, and that's loading, unloading time, and also the wasted time of trying to find uh, trailers and and equipment, whether that be a trailer, a chassis, or a container. Uh, What's interesting is one study, it was done a little while ago, but it's it's pretty apparent. It it showed that 40% of a truck's time is spent idling. So 50% is actually what they call in cruise mode. And just, I think everyone's aware, diesel engines are notoriously uh, poor when they're idling, specifically because there's a pre-combustion part, which doesn't actually burn as uh, readily as when it's under cruise. So again, I think the key, you know, around, you know, to be the biggest savings would be, hey, we just have to eliminate idling. And if we can eliminate a lot of the wasted time uh, and actually get drivers back on the road and actually help them make more money, that's, that's the key. One other thing I'd like to add to is reefer loads. A lot of people you know, know that reefer um, loading and loading takes more time. And, it, and when you have a refrigerated load, you actually have two engines running at the same time. So uh, I think one of the keys to get to that where you can actually get rid of that uh, excess wait time and idling is better visibility and know where your trucks are, know what the status of your trucks are, not just your trucks, but your trailers and all your ancillary equipment. So you can actually improve the, the velocity. And, and you did mention electrification, which is big. And by the way, our, our technology is being used to track electric buses right now in Israel and actually monitor and manage the charging patterns of those. But keep in mind, electric vehicles are only as clean as the electric source itself, what the generation is coming from. So uh, that's also an important thing to keep in mind. You know, that's certainly true. You know, if you're uh, generating your electricity from a you know a coal-fired power plant, then you know what really are are you doing uh, with EV? So that is certainly part of the uh, overall picture uh, moving forward. Uh, but you did a, a fine job, I think, of of highlighting some of the uh, inefficiencies in our industry that you know are, are pretty persistent. But when you look at the transportation industry today, you know what do you see as the biggest technology and operational hurdles that are really holding fleets back from being as efficient as possible. 
I'd say it's, uh, and this is going to sound like a buzzword, but uh, it's really uh, total supply chain visibility. And by that, I mean, you know, if you think about the military where they have battlefield awareness, where every branch of the government knows what the other one is doing, hopefully, you know, in a battlefield situation. And the way they do that is with technology, right? But they also have a command and control uh, setup. So the, knowing where your assets are, as I mentioned before, and your drivers in real time, and knowing the status of, of all your equipment and the real status, you have to be able to trust the data. And uh, so, you know, is the asset in the right status? Is it, you know, does it need repair? Is the driver in the right status? And does he have enough hours to actually do the work at hand? Um, so again, I, I think the, that data then has to get integrated back into the transportation management system. Most of the large carriers have that, but better yet, it has to be almost seamlessly integrated then into the yard scheduling and the dock scheduling systems. And again, there's some room for improvement in that. Lastly, I'd say if shippers and consignees uh, would support it, there's huge opportunity for uh, fleets to partner, you know, so that way you can optimize their own freight networks. You know, I have a truck coming into a yard, uh, the other fleet's trailer is getting ready to pick up. You know, it's like the trailer ratios to tractor ratios are, are pretty out of whack. So it's like, you know, if, if we could do better trailer pooling with, you know, between fleets, uh, those are some like more holistic opportunities. I think the whole industry has in front of them. Okay. And, you know, putting this uh, conversation about emissions aside, of course, there's been, you know, a lot of discussion, you know, particularly uh, over the course of the past year or so about, uh, you know, a more sustainable supply chain. But, you know, when you look at, um, you know, how you get there, you know, saving fuel, uh, reducing deadhead, all that also just makes, you know, good business sense. You know, and, and traditionally fleets have looked at asset tracking technology, you know, really as a way to better utilize their existing equipment. You know, how do you improve the overall efficiency of your business? Uh, but what I, I'm curious about the conversations that you have with uh, some of your customers uh, do you hear about, you know, emissions and sustainability as part of the conversation with some of your customers? Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, since I'm an old timer, I've been in the industry for 30 years, I actually came out of the uh, transportation supply chain industry, as you know. Um, if you think about it, it's it initially was coming top down, but it's also coming bottom up. I mean, think about the Gen Zers now that are in the workforce or coming into the workforce. They actually expect companies and they expect management uh, to uh, be what I'd say climate responsible. Uh, but on the top down, I, I, I run a public company and uh, my investors are asking me what our sustainability programs are. So, you know, if you think about Walmart, you know, any of the large, you know, publicly traded companies out there, trucking or otherwise, uh, from the investors all the way through the board of directors, all the way from the executive staff, everyone understands that, you know, they have a an obligation to be good stewards of the planet, I believe. You know, I'm hearing that across the board. Uh, but also, like you just mentioned, there's a twofer. I mean, usually you will get a twofer if you invest in this, right? You're going to invest in uh, certain uh, uh, sustainable initiatives. And for that, you're probably going to get better uh, fuel economy, right? So, you know, I, and maybe even healthier employees. So I think at the time, you, you might get, you know, two for one, uh, depending on uh, what you implement. Yeah, certainly something that can be a, a win-win, you know, that's depending on the, you know, if you look back at uh, uh, commercial vehicle technology, depending on which step in the, you know, in the EPA regulations, I mean, some have been, um, you know, a larger cost for the industry to bear and others, I think like the you know, greenhouse gas standards uh, tend to be, you know, uh, something that pays back you know, to, to the, the end customer, the fleet that will purchase the, the vehicle because you'll get that better fuel economy uh, from some of the, the newer engines and newer vehicles. Uh, but you, you mentioned Walmart earlier, you know, that's one example of, you know, a major corporation, you know, uh, Amazon is another, you know, that have been announcing some pretty aggressive goals uh, for environmental sustainability in the coming decades. So I'm wondering, you know, to what extent are large shippers like that driving the focus on fuel efficiency and reducing emissions in trucking, whether it's, you know, not necessarily electric vehicles, but also, you know, just better efficiency, better planning, freight visibility, um, reducing deadhead, improving utilization. You know, how much is that is coming from the shippers? I think a large part of it's coming from shippers. And the way you can tell that is, you know, if you go out and, and you know, just you can Google uh, sustainability pages for like some of the larger carriers, 
And most of them are setting themselves up as that's a competitive differentiator. So and the only reason you would do that is if, you know, the shipping uh, population out there, the shipper population uh, saw value in it and we're pushing it. And so it's, you know, if you did that maybe seven years ago, five years ago, you know, that you wouldn't even have found a page. You know, I, I would say now that most of the major uh, carriers are trying to differentiate themselves and make sure the shippers know what they are doing for sustainability because, the companies you just mentioned, I mean, they have huge, you know, parts of their cost structure uh, are around transportation of goods. I mean, Amazon alone, I think was like $70 billion a year they spent on transportation, if I remember the number correctly. And Walmart, you know, has got a phenomenal uh, transportation system, um, you know, for their brick and mortar stores. And so again, transportation, whether or not it's their own transportation or it's their contracted inbound transportation there's huge part of their uh, sustainability has got to be the, the transport of the goods uh, into their warehouses and then out of their warehouses. So I think you see carriers kind of just reacting to that and saying, I have to help uh, these companies hit their sustainability goals. Yep. This is an, like you said, it's a, it can be a differentiator for some of those large companies that are looking for uh, efficiency and sustainability, you know, a carrier that can, can meet them on that, you know, may, you know can certainly have a, a leg up in the, in the marketplace. Uh, with those customers. From time to time, an issue commands so much of the industry's attention that it requires a deeper dive, a resource readers can turn to, a transport topic special report. This month, we're turning our attention to another big issue, electrification and the key factors that will drive this industry trend. In every case, we're working to provide our readers with information, analysis, and clarity on key issues confronting fleets. One comprehensive resource packed with insights that can give you the edge. Transport Topics invites you to learn more about our special reports. To reserve your copy of the latest special report, visit ttn.ws forward slash electrification. I'd like to you know, kind of shift gears a little bit to you know, talk, talk about another um, aspect of, of asset tracking technology, and, and that's the the rise of solar powered tracking devices. You know, that's really become uh, more commonplace uh, in, in recent years. Uh, so I, I'm curious to hear how that's uh, progressing at uh, Powerfleet. You know, how many of your customers at this point are you know installing solar powered devices to to track their trailers and, and other assets? Yeah. I don't know if you saw, I mean, we've had some recent big wins uh, with our, what we call our LV500. That's our solar pa uh, powered uh, mobility platform uh, for trailers and containers. It's uh, also got super cap technology, which I think is a phenomenal differentiator for us. So just so you know, a container or trailer typically lasts 10 to 12 years in the field, right? You know, you amortize that, depreciate that asset over that period of time. Our product is actually engineered to last beyond that. So, you know, you put a solar, uh, our solar panel LV500 you know, on there, super caps are engineered to last over 15 years. The, the solar panels are rated at 20. So again, this is something that you can put on and, and kind of, you know, forget. The good thing is it's also a platform. And I think what you're saying is it's not just a box of beeps and tells you where the trailer is. Uh, this integrates into our freight camera system. Uh, Day and Ross, you know, they selected us because Day and Ross out of Canada selected us because of our, our camera system. Uh, one of the largest brick and mortar uh, retailers has picked us for their container fleet. Uh, again, once you can see the data that comes back now, you know, from the ancillary sensors that we can connect to for temperature, vibe, shock, humidity, but also image capture. Uh, it just changes what you can do with the data, getting back to this whole issue of visibility the, the, and status. If I know the right status, I know it's in the right, you're loaded correctly, you know, before the driver gets there, uh, you can save a lot of headache and heartache and idle time down the road. So, uh, and by the way, we also have a, a completely engineered family of products. You know, it's uh, what we tried to do is say, What's the use case? And a lot of customers nowadays, and you know this, you know, they have chassis, they have dry vans, they have refrigerated, uh, they have containers, and, you know, obviously they have trucks. We actually have a solution for every one of those. And we actually have a solution that has the same uh, DNA as a platform uh, that can do a lot of the same capability, which is great. So I can tell you the temp, the shive, the, uh, the vibe, and the humidity on every one of my platforms. And there's like a mesh networking capability behind those. So 
and, and it's cost effective. You know, I have something for almost <laughs> probably for everybody in their budget and for their asset. So it, it's, it's a one-stop shop that we can offer. Yeah, and it's certainly uh, come a long way from, you know, just the, the dots on the map, you know, where is the trailer? There's, there's more and more information you can capture and, you know, power management is a big part of that. And, and solar is, is one way to, to, to solve that, uh, uh, that, that problem, especially for, you know, again, assets like a trailer or a container that, you know, maybe in use for a decade or more. Um, you know, I, I would like to, you know, bring up, uh, unfortunately, this, this topic that uh, we cannot escape still, uh, which is the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic that unfortunately we're still dealing with as we move into the, the new year. Uh, but, you know, I think it's interesting to think about how this has affected the technology piece of the transportation market. You know, I've, I've consistently heard, you know, pretty much across the board that, you know, the disruption caused by this, uh, this crisis has really highlighted gaps in freight visibility and, and other weaknesses. But, you know, I, I'd like to hear your perspective on how this event has changed the way that shippers, carriers, and, and 3PLs are thinking about uh, their supply chains, uh, as well as supply chain sustainability. I think in general, and I might have mentioned this before, but it's the, the fact that our uh, supply chains are so specialized that they're not very flexible. So, you know, if you're a ball caller uh, and all of a sudden you got to switch over to, you know, go to home delivery, uh, it's very difficult to do with the assets that you have or even the way your operations are set up. So I think we learned that. Uh, the question is going to be is as we move into the future, you know, so how do you get equipment that can, that can be dual purpose? Uh, that can be repurposed. So, uh, you know, if you're an automotive parts hauler and, and that industry goes into a recession because of COVID or whatever reason, you know, you know, how can you be more versatile, you know, and, and how, you know, and the other industries that are on fire, you know, they need excess capacity. So it's like, you know, we need to make sure that our, you know, the assets that we use, the way they're configured, uh, you know, how do you be specialized so that you can give some unique service, but yet at the same time, uh, make those more horizontally applicable so that you can move capacity back and forth. I think that's the bigger industry uh, problems that have to be solved. Um, the good thing is we're actually seeing, you know, we use our data analytics uh, across many geographies and across many markets, whether it's warehousing, manufacturing, uh, et cetera. And we're actually seeing, you know, it's, it's good to see from Q2 with a slow and steady progress of economies you know, coming back online. Obviously, it's still lumpy and there's a lot of things you know that we have to be concerned about especially here in the states with covid and and it's you know it's not under control so uh you know again I, we do see it coming back online we do know that those holes in the supply chain and that lack of flexibility is there and i think our our products actually help people know where those assets are it's now a question of uh you know can we get customers to start start sharing that data so they have that battlefield awareness that I talked about earlier? Okay, and then you know, in, in general, uh, I, I'm curious also about you know how the you know pandemic has affected uh, you know the technology market in trucking uh, overall. You know, of course, you know many trucking companies faced uh, some some serious financial challenges during this time, depending you know in which sector of the economy they're operating in, uh, but. Uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you know, this event has also highlighted the value of uh, visibility and, and technology adoption. So, you know, what are you seeing at PowerFleet? Are you, are you seeing, you know, a continued strong market for uh, uh, technology, you know, despite some of those financial challenges in, in some uh, parts of the industry? Yeah, it's a very good question. In our industrial segment, and, and by the way, that makes us unique in the whole uh, telemetry mobility space, is that we actually are on forklifts, material handling equipment, at Walmart, at the United States Postal Service, at Ford, at Toyota. I mean, we're like a Procter & Gamble, Nestle. I can just keep naming the name. So <clears throat> that part, because it's really a, an asset that's used in a cost center, uh, there were a lot of capital expenditures that were put on hold, <clears throat> primarily in, uh, you know, like manufacturing. You know, if you're in non-essential manufacturing, a lot of those projects were put on hold. But if you were in essential uh, goods and services like grocery and last mile delivery, <clears throat> those projects uh, continued, you know, like the world's largest online retailer. Uh, you know, we actually had a partner of ours bring us into many of their locations this past year. <clears throat> and Rider Logistics uh, signed us up in Q2 to outfit over 30 of their uh, sites in North America. So if you're in transportation 
and you have the cash or available uh, capital, uh, downtimes are the time to invest. And that's what we always did when I was in the industry. It's like, you know, if you have the cash and the access to capital, it's the best time to do it because you can get to your assets and you can get them. Uh, and then when you come out, you're going to be stronger and more efficient. Yeah, no doubt being ready to go when, you know, things you know tick back up again. Uh, now, before I let you go, Chris, I just want to get a, you know, a final thought on, uh, you know, what industry trends that you're watching most closely as we move into 2021. Uh, what do you, what are the big trends and, and issues that, uh, uh, you'll be watching? Well, I think the for all of us, it's the new administration in Washington. And then, you know, if you just said, okay, what's, you know, what's their programs and legislation going to be on COVID relief, economic stimulus, the vaccine distribution, highway infrastructure, and climate change, you know, which is the beginning of your uh, questions, I think we're all kind of waiting to see, okay, you know, what what's going to roll out, what's going to be real, because that'll actually impact a lot of our strategic initiatives. Uh, technologically, uh, we're looking at the 3G to 5G sunset. I mean, you know, that's still happening. It's, it's active today. And, uh, you know, that's going to be accelerating over the next 18 to 24 months. I think it kind of got lost in the COVID dust. And if you think about it, last year, 2019, most fleets and carriers were implementing the ELD HOS mandate. So, you know, their capital dollars were going to that, their attention was on that, training drivers. And now, now it's going to have to turn to all those assets that are running on 3G networks that have to upgrade. And there's quite a few of them. And there's only like about 18 months to go. So 18 to 24 months. So I think a lot of people are going to be making a lot of decisions in the next year. And then uh, this whole trend toward last mile delivery, you know, obviously, you know, it's kind of the pig and the python here with, you know, home delivery over the COVID pandemic. But, you know, that trend is going to continue. And uh, we're also looking at what is the future status of the United States Postal Service. They are a big customer of ours, uh, but also just in the mix of home and last mile, you know, what's their role going to be, you know, when the new administration is in charge. Well, thank you for that, Chris. There's certainly a lot to, to look forward to, and we'll, we'll, there's certainly be a lot of uh, uh, new developments to watch in, in this year ahead. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you, you know, getting us off to a good start here and, and sharing your thoughts with us. It's great to have you back on. Hey, Seth, thank you for having me on. And uh, anytime you want to talk, feel free to give me a call. In times like these, it's crucial to stay informed. Transport Topics is offering all the information you need to make business decisions in these unprecedented times. And in the wake of the many event cancellations and group gatherings, TT ensures a virtual way to consume business content and conversation. To join the conversation and stay ahead of the news, follow Transport Topics on all social outlets or by visiting ttn.ws forward slash stay informed. Next on Road Signs, we're excited to welcome Jeff Baer, founder and CEO of LinkDrive, a supplier of technology designed to help fleet operators boost fuel efficiency. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Seth. So in this episode, we're looking at how fleets are utilizing technology to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve fuel economy. So of course, there are so many different variables that affect fuel consumption and trucking. You know, that of course includes the vehicle's fuel mileage, uh, as well as how well a company utilizes equ its equipment and how well it optimizes its routes. But another huge factor is how the driver actually operates the vehicle. So let's start there. You know, from your vantage point, uh, just how much does driver performance affect a fleet's overall fuel economy? So what we see typically is around 30 to 35% of the MPG distribution for the fleet or, or even a single, single driver is uh, under the driver's control. The rest of it is, are things that are mostly out of their control. And uh, typically, we see a fairly normal distribution across across the driver pools. That's very helpful because it goes to show just how much you know really rests with how the driver actually operates the vehicle, and uh, that's that's certainly something that should never be overlooked. And uh, fleets, of course, understand that. But the question is, how do you you know train up your drivers so they are uh, constantly improving and getting the most uh, out of the vehicle and, and the most out of their fuel? And Link Drive's approach to this is to give drivers feedback so they can improve their performance as they go. Now, for listeners who might not be familiar with your Pedal Coach application, 
Uh, could you just take a moment, Jeff, and explain how it works? Sure, sure. So uh, it, it was said a few years back that uh, pedal coach is something like a Fitbit for fuel economy. And I think that's one of the best sort of illustrations. And most of us are aware of the fitness trackers that are pervasive these days. But, uh, you know, the reality is it's, it's primarily real time feedback. It's positive feedback. It's giving them an achievable uh, fuel target uh, that's basically taking everything out of their control out of the picture. So we're running some really cool math in real time within the Android application uh, to set that target for the driver. And, uh, you know, basically with every mile they drive, uh, they are racking up points uh, that culminate in a score, which is uh, the basis for us to be able to answer uh, one question we don't really think anybody else has got a, much of a clue on, which is the driver doing the best he or she can with what they have to work with. Sure. Now, driver training, of course, is one important way to improve fuel efficiency across a, a fleet. but you know, at the same time, you know, we see how much the trucking industry right now is struggling with high driver turnover rates, you know, especially in long haul truck load operations. And that's really tough because if you invest a lot in training and getting the most out of your drivers and really helping them improve, uh, but your drivers end up leaving a year later, you know, you're right back to square one with uh, another uh, new driver who needs to be trained. Uh, so I want to get your thoughts on that, Jeff. Uh, should fleets be thinking about driver retention you know, again, you know, indirectly as a, uh, an important factor for fuel efficiency. Oh, we think so. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the reality is we think that, you know, driver engagement is the key. And uh, we, we broadened out the solution a little bit to go beyond just the real time pedal coaching for fuel economy, because we realized that, uh, you know, by making the driver feel that they're part of a team uh, to give, you know, clear, positive goals and positive coaching that's automated, uh, we can we can get their chin up, right, and put a bounce in their step. And when when we're able to do that and get the driver's head in the game, so to speak, or or help them remember what they already know in many cases around productivity, safety, and efficiency, uh, they want to stick around because they feel like they're part of a team. And you know that's to me one of the most exciting things about where we're, we've taken the product and and partnering with the Behavioral Insights team, we've been able to really take the platform to a new level. Sure. Now, uh, you know, another piece of that, of course, is uh, driver pay. And, you know, in, in recent years, especially, we've seen some fleets implement uh, performance based pay uh, to reward their safest and most efficient drivers. But, you know, the question is, you know, how do you implement a program like that? Do you have the data to do that right? Uh, but I, I want to get your thoughts, Jeff, you know, how much can performance based pay programs or bonus programs uh, how much of an impact does that really have on driver retention? And what are the obstacles you need to overcome as a fleet to actually establish a, a bonus program like that, that, you know, again, is, is rewarding a driver who, who really achieves, uh, you know, uh, top-notch uh, MPG uh, based on how they drive the vehicle? Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, most of our customers and partners are, are doing some form of performance-based pay. And uh, to me, that's a no-brainer in a way. or not a no, It's not a no-brainer to pull off, but uh, it, there must be something in it for the drivers. Uh, and not, not to say that money is just enough, right? They, they want more than that. But what, we can, what we've seen with uh, the programs that we've deployed is over a 10% improvement in driver turnover. And uh, that's, uh, you know, even better in, in many cases, but that's a number that we can stand behind and, and have references for. And, you know, the reality is some of the things I was mentioning before about really getting the driver to feel like they're part of a team is is the key. Um, and it, it is really difficult in a sense, or or it is if you're working with Excel spreadsheets and, and uh, you know, from various departments, right? But, you know, in the world we live in in 2020, there's some really great tools uh, to do to basically take math and common sense and apply machine learning to it, uh, you know, to, as I said earlier, take everything that's out of the driver's control out of the picture. So, you know, most of our, uh, most of the people that come looking for us are, you know, have some sort of a program that's very, very manual, very, very costly from a time and, and labor perspective, usually salaried employees spending the bulk of their time driving these things from Excel. And ultimately, uh, you know, the programs are seen as maybe, not sure if they're really clearly successful or not. They become entitlements over time, often to the drivers, and drivers aren't really sure why they are getting the bonuses. Uh, that communication can be really tricky. And again, uh, if we use Excel spreadsheets, 
we might be able to understand it, but it might be late to do anything about it with the drivers. But by using, you know, this fair, positive, machine learning driven behavioral science to, to provide automated, fair, positive coaching, uh, it's actually pretty easy. Right. And uh, and, you know, it's fun whenever the drivers know exactly what's in it. And and we get we hear banter going back and forth about what they're going to do to raise their score. So, um, you know, that's the, those are the types of conversations we like to have. Uh, with our customers as you know and get them out of that spreadsheet madness <laughs> yeah uh still a lot of uh, manual processes that can certainly be streamlined in in trucking operations in the back office uh and yeah in, in 2020 it's, it's certainly time to you know to look at, at better ways of doing things and and to your point it's not just about you know gathering the data uh on mpg is also taking into account different factors that may have influenced uh, MPG. Maybe it's traffic and, and weather conditions, or just where your your, your route is taking you. Uh, but also communicating that with the driver, and the driver can understand their own performance and see that the you know the you know the real results uh, you know that that their performance uh, has on the operation, and then be rewarded for it. And then, you know, just, just shifting gears a little bit, I, you know, I, I, it's it's hard to escape this topic these days, but, um, you know, I do want to bring up the coronavirus pandemic because it's been, you know, so disruptive, uh, for, for so many transportation companies and for, you know, society in general. Uh, but at least in the early days of the pandemic, you know, one small silver lining we saw was, you know, with the reduction in passenger car traffic. Uh, just with fewer people traveling, more people staying at home. Of course, that's less traffic for truck drivers uh, to deal with. And, you know, there's some degree of benefit there in terms of safety and also fuel economy. And if you're, you know, stuck in traffic, you're, you're not going to get the best uh, fuel efficiency. So, uh, you know, based in, on what you see uh, at, at your company and with your customers, uh, are you still seeing some, some impact in, in traffic conditions due to the pandemic? And then just more you know, broadly, can you speak to the overall impact that traffic congestion and highway infrastructure can really have on fuel economy in the real world? Sure. Yeah, we definitely are seeing, uh, you know, an increase in traffic congestion, uh, you know, seen primarily through, you know, a little bit slower speeds. Uh, the speeds are still higher than they were through a, a lot of the, the bottlenecks that we track uh, than they were pre-coronavirus. But uh you know, so it's better than it was last year, but uh, still, it's uh, you know, it, it's it's got there's an impact, and, and the, certainly there's more commercial traffic on the road uh, with that, and uh, some new patterns, new traffic patterns, basically as the supply chain is the bullwhip of inventory is moved through the supply chain from the paper towels and toilet paper to the food and everything else. Um, you know, there's places where there's not enough parking. And, you know, you know, before there was plenty, maybe. Right. And so we're seeing increases even in detention and and uh, and parking type situations. Uh, you know, and it, it, what I what I don't really like about it is that in all cases, it seems like the drivers are the ones that just are expected to pick up the slack and figure it out. So uh, one of the things uh, that our system does is give out badges for those things that are out of the driver's control. And that's another way we can see uh, that uh, the, the congestion is picking up again. So typically, uh, if a driver spends a lot of time uh, in low speed traffic uh, that would normally be over the road, they would get a badge indicating that, right? So we were handing out a lot less badges the first half of this year, I'll say. And, uh, you know, we've been, you can see us handing out those badges again. And those badges, it's kind of funny because in a way you can think of a, almost as an excuse as to, you know, why didn't I get nine miles a gallon? But in reality, it's, we're showing them that, that we can see what they're dealing with and just invalidating that uh, there's no longer a need for an excuse, right? It, 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 it flips the whole conversation. So, you know, the uh, pressure on the drivers is they are expected to pick up the slack, uh, you know, in the supply chain as as things massively evolve. You know, it leads to people being in a hurry sometimes. Uh, that's never good, uh, you know, not only for safety, but for fuel economy. And, you know, it's it's really just not a nice way to drive to, to feel like you're in a hurry. Right. And uh, so, we, you know, we we hear drivers talking about that now. We see, the, you know, risk, you know, we see uh, temptations to, to run out of route some places to try to get around this stuff. Uh, whereas in reality, most of our customers want their drivers to kind of ride it out and go with the flow. Um, so, you know, there's 
there's definitely a, a pretty big impact. Uh, but but we love that this remote workforce that that we're a part of in in the drivers is is sort of now many people are are investing in that. How do we do that better? They are so vital and so important. So I hope as we you know as as we look ahead that that we see a lot more of that. Yeah, let's hope for that. And you know you as you you know, start to look ahead, uh, you know which I appreciate as we. You know, with this podcast, we we love to you know kind of track the trends that are beginning to emerge and and you know ask ourselves where the industry is headed. Uh, so I'd like to end with that, Jeff. You know, I'd just like to get a few more of your thoughts on you know this year ahead. You know, are there any particular industry trends that you're watching most closely as we uh, begin to move into 2021? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're excited about you know the the changes on the truck side of things, really, from electrification and the you know the path towards autonomous. You know, to us. It's less about replacing the driver and, uh, you know, tools like ours, you know, help the drivers, you know, to learn those new technologies and things. Right. So all our principles uh, apply to those vehicles as well. And we've seen we've heard a lot of it this year. My hope is we start seeing more, particularly electric vehicles. And certainly there are places where they make uh, some sense right now. But uh, we'll be following that closely. You know, we're hoping for the best for our customers with respect to the rates and the and the volumes and, uh, you know, and the fuel costs. And, uh, you know, we hope, uh, we hope that, uh, some changes that we and others are making are, are effective to bring more drivers into this industry. Right. So my hope is that with, uh, you know, collective focus from America in a way sort of being on these truck drivers that we can turn that, you know, thank a trucker, uh, mentality into, you know, make the world better for truckers and, you know, make people want to be a trucker, right? In a way, a truck driver. And so those are what we're going to be watching very closely. Yeah, I think it'll be a, a very interesting year uh, in 2021. And uh, I'll, I'll already, uh, we'll, we'll certainly hope that it'll be a better year than, than 2020. And uh, that's not a very high bar to clear, but uh, uh, I think we have a very interesting year uh, in store. It's interesting to see all the technologies come together and uh, hopefully the greater appreciation for the truck driver and uh, the transportation industry uh, that's come about because of the coronavirus pandemic uh, will carry over into the year ahead and, and for many years to come. But uh, I think that's a, a great stopping point there. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, leave it there. Uh, but Jeff, I you know, really appreciate you joining the podcast and sharing your insights. I uh, really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, likewise. I hope I hope you got what you wanted. And, uh, you know, thanks. It was it was fun to sort of sit back and think uh, through these questions so often, you know, in the grind of building this business. And, uh, you know, thanks for, um, for getting my creative uh, juices flowing again. <laughs> of course. Well, thank you, Jeff. Did you know you can ask Alexa to open Transport Topics? In just one minute, you will hear the biggest trucking headlines of that day. Be prepared and start your morning off right with Transport Topics. Before we close, let's take a moment to revisit our original question. What role can fleet management technology play in the push to reduce emissions and fuel consumption in the trucking industry? It's been fascinating to watch the first wave of zero emission electric trucks hit the road. And of course, diesel trucks will continue to become more efficient under the phase two greenhouse gas emission standards. But there's still a great deal of opportunity to save fuel and therefore decrease carbon emissions by optimizing fleet management. Greater freight visibility can set the stage for better route planning and dispatching decisions, which can in turn reduce empty miles and wasted fuel. At the same time, in-cab technology can help drivers operate their vehicles more efficiently, another key factor in fuel economy. It's clear that fleets can take significant steps to reduce their fuel expenses and help support their customers' sustainability goals with technology that is already widely available today. If you've enjoyed this episode of Road Signs, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, share them with me and the Road Signs team. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. And we'll be back in two weeks with part three of our series on transportation technology trends in 2021. Next time, we'll provide an update on the emergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning in transportation software. Until then, I'm Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening.